Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's program on exploring participatory grant making in the Jewish community. This program is part of a joint project of JFN and Upstart called Granted that we launched just about a year ago to help strengthen the relationships between grant makers and grant seekers. In addition to organizing monthly programs such as this one and facilitated conversations, Granted offers a wide range of tools, articles, case studies, and other resources on its website, www.jgranted.org, and I encourage you to visit um, that website after our program today. And today we will have time together to explore participatory grant making, or PGM. As always, our goal at Jewish Funders Network is to, to empower our members and the broader Jewish philanthropic community and the field to be as strategic and impactful as possible. And thanks to the generosity of Crown Family Philanthropies, we were able to hire Third Plateau Social Impact Strategies to research and author a guidebook on PGM, which will be launched at JFN's conference in just a few weeks in late March. PGM is an inclusive approach to grant making that is increasingly popular in the mainstream philanthropic world, but yet little is known about that about it in the Jewish community, and we believe it will be of interest to many Jewish grant makers and grant seekers and is worth us coming together to explore and discuss. Our goal is neither to champion or dismiss PGM, but rather af affirm that it is important innovation in philanthropy and one that, can that we can use to a variety of degrees and one that offers many potential benefits. At today's webinar, we will be given an overview of PGM. We will have an opportunity to spotlight a speaker who can speak to their experience in, in participatory grant making in the Jewish community. And we will also have a chance for questions and answers. To help us kick off today's program, I'm really pleased to welcome Rachel Giottino, Program Officer at Crown Family Philanthropies, to share a few words about why they, as a foundation, are interested in PGM. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thanks, Tamar. First, I want to thank everyone for joining us today to learn with each other about participatory grant making. I want to say a special thank you to Tamar and the Jewish Funders Network and also to Ariel and Jure and Third Plateau for making this green book and all of the learning sessions that are going with it a possibility. And also a special thank you to Lani from Footsteps for agreeing to talk about your own experience with, particip with participatory grant making uh, later in this session. At Crown, we have a modest uh, staff directed fund, which allows us to come together as a team and think about new areas of grant making the foundation isn't funding in, and also to experiment with new ways of doing our grant making. A few years ago, we dipped our toes into the water with participatory grant making, and that was what really inspired us to go to the Jewish Funders Network and ask them to put together this green book so that the greater field can learn more about different ways of creating impact. So today, we're excited to learn alongside our foundation and nonprofit colleagues about how we can empower community voices to increase our impact. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tamar. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you again for your partnership and for your colleagues' um, partnership in putting this guidebook together and coming to us to really push us to explore this topic. And now I'm excited to introduce my partners from Third Plateau that will lead us through all the interesting information that they learned and, and teach us um, about participatory grant making. So Ariel and Jure, off to you, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Ariel Platt. I am a director at Third Plateau. I work on our strategy team and with our Jewish community impact team. Uh, can I just get a thumbs up tomorrow? You can see my screen okay? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Fantastic. So JFN approached our team to research PGM and to prepare this guidebook for the Jewish philanthropic community and just more broadly for the communal sector. I'm joined by my colleagues on this call, Madeline Lobosco and Lance Bittner Laird, who are instrumental in the research and development of this book. So to prepare this guidebook, we reviewed over 50 reports. We conducted 22 interviews with funders, researchers, PGM practitioners. And we engaged a number of people in the participatory grant making space and Jewish philanthropic community to review the work. Today in this presentation, I'm going to share a definition for PGM 
several models for what it looks like, how it actually materializes in the philanthropic world. I'll give a little bit of background about the practice and why it's become increasingly attractive. I'll detail some of the benefits and challenges and ultimately explore how participatory grant making can play a role in the Jewish community. Before we jump in, I'd just like to start with a question to frame the overview. So if the goal of philanthropy is meaningful impact, then this question about who is best qualified to make that impact is at the root of any conversation about participatory grant making. And so the question you see before you is, which individuals or groups are best qualified to make meaningful philanthropic impact in a given organization, community, city or ecosystem, and in what contexts? Different grant makers will have varied answers to this question, which in turn, of course, informs if, how, and when exploring PGM might be valuable. So let's speak about the background for just a moment. There are a number of factors that have contributed recently in the last two, five, 10, but really the last two to three years uh, contributed to increased exploration of participatory methods. Uh, even this morning, some of you may have seen in eJewish philanthropy, there's a piece about sharing power and reimagining philanthropy's commitment to racial equity. So rising wealth inequality, heightened societal focus on racial and economic justice, and of course the pandemic have sparked scrutiny of the modern philanthropic enterprise. And many grant makers are revisiting, reconsidering their approaches to funding with increased emphasis on transparency, collaboration and accountability. And so participatory grant making bridges the gap between grant makers and those that they serve, helping to include and sometimes even empower the people and communities affected by the funding decisions to influence, to play a role, and at times even direct the decision making. So here's the definition that we'll use today and throughout this conversation. This comes from Ben Robel and Meg Macy's book, Letting Go, which I happen to keep right here next to my computer at all times. It was published in 2021 and is a really valuable overview of the role participation can play in philanthropy and in impact investing. And so their definition, their definition is that participatory grant making shifts decision-making power over grant making to the very communities most affected by those decisions. To be clear, it's not a binary, right? Grant makers need not either cede all power or none at all. There are many different ways to empower community voices throughout different stages of the grant making process. And so here is a spectrum that depicts a range of ways from least participatory to most participatory that organizations can consider um, including participation in their practices. One question that often comes up is who exactly are the participants, right? Who's doing the participation? And so it could be leaders of organizations, it could be researchers, activists, organizers focused on a relevant cause or community, individuals with lived experience of the issue at hand, various communal leaders. The point is, these are individuals who are of and from the community that's being funded and thus have a perspective, and some would say perhaps have um, the best perspective about what they need. Not everyone agrees that that's the truth. And like we said at the beginning, different organizations and different funders with different priorities will fall at different places on this spectrum. So there are a number of models for how to incorporate different participants. I'm gonna run through these. And of course, if there are questions at the end, we can revisit in more detail. The representative committee involves different sector experts, leaders, organizers that can be included in the decision-making process. A mixed model offers you know, some of the organization's board members, but also reserves some of those seats um, to have voting rights for non-board members. And it could be one, it could be half, it could be a majority. Again, there are many, many ways to do this, um, but this is one way that organizations can preserve the board's voice in funding decisions while also bringing in other non-board voting members. I just want to note that, you know, asking one person to speak on behalf of, you know, or otherwise represent an entire group, especially one that has a marginalized identity, can lead to harmful tokenism. So there are inherent challenges in any of these models, bringing in 
one individual or even a smaller group of individuals to speak on behalf of everyone. In the rolling applicant committee, it's a model where professionals at grant receiving organizations actually become the grant decision makers for the subsequent round of funding. And so in that way, those receiving the funds get to also put on the hats of those allocating the funds to their peer organizations at a later time. Finally, the closed collective empowers those seeking funds to also be a part of the decision-making process. So everyone applying in a given round of funding discusses and votes on how to allocate funds to one another. Like I said before, each of these models has benefits and has challenges. Um, we'll walk through some of those right now. Participatory grant making in the organized philanthropic sector is a fairly new practice. There are many questions around effectiveness. There's been ample research about process outcomes. And by that, I mean how grant seekers and how grant makers work together to make decisions. There's less data really on grant outcomes. And that's how participatory grant making actually enhances impact. So in terms of the process benefits, I'll go through just a few. Um, it can contribute to improved trust and relationships between grant making organizations and grant receiving organizations. Increased participation in this way can help improve um, the dialogue and conversation and the trust that those giving the funds have in those receiving them. It can also, like we said at the beginning, bridge the experiential gap between grant makers and grant seekers. Oftentimes the people awarding funds are um, disconnected from or not familiar in the same way with those quote on the ground. And that might be because of differences in power in wealth in uh, race and lived experience. There are a number of reasons, even just in age. And so in this way, the gap becomes close. Um, the, we close the gap between those two parties. Participation can increase funding organizations exposure to organizations and to different leaders and can also have capacity building effects for grant seekers and social movements when those looking for funding can play more of a decision making role they themselves can become um, better empowered to seek funds from other places and build relationships across organizations and so with that point in mind grant makers seeking to strengthen or expand their own diversity equity and inclusion work looking at these process outcomes can really help demonstrate potential shifts in power dynamics, trust, dialogue with marginalized or underrepresented communities. Here are some of the challenges. Demands on time and capacity. You might imagine that this is not a simple process, convening these different kinds of stakeholders, convening organizations together in the same room to talk about funding uh, can be extremely taxing. Um, time intensive, there can be ample conflicts of interests. Uh, you know, imagine, for example, the political and relational challenges of a Jewish funder focused on social justice and supporting low income uh, Haredi or ultra Orthodox Jews, uniting representatives from those communities in productive process around funding. Certainly not impossible, also very complex. And like any kind of organizational change, Exploring participatory grant making entails a certain mindset, including openness to making mistakes, a commitment to ongoing learning, willingness to implement changes, uh, empowering non-professional grant makers to make funding decisions is extremely complex. So th those are some of the challenges. I'll end by sharing just a few words about the role PGM can play in the Jewish, in the Jewish philanthropic sector. Ultimately, they share fundamental values, right? PGM and Jewish philanthropy are rooted in community philanthropy, right? They rely on individuals of and from the community to address collective needs. We have the example of mutual aid societies, the Landsmannschaften in the 19th and 20th centuries for Jews emigrating to the United States. Federations pool community resources to address communal needs. And if we go even further back in time, uh, Jewish wisdom literature in a Pirkei Avot, the teachings or ethics of our ancestors, quote, who is wise? The one who's wise is one who learns from all people. So there are, there's ample overlap um, in the ethos that both Jewish philanthropy and PGM share. So today, Jewish philanthropy 
it relies much more heavily on individual donor generosity than on communal input. And so there's been a transition over time. In terms of the second point here that some prioritize in the Jewish field, community representation in funding decisions, we know that many in Jewish philanthropy see themselves as representatives of the Jewish community. They may attend synagogues, send their kids to day school, or go to Moshe House, or participate in other Jewish communal organizations. And yet, like I named before, there oftentimes can still be distance, that gap between the people making the funding decisions and the people receiving them. Um, receiving the funds. Again, age, wealth, denominational affiliation, country of origin, race, all contribute to this gap. There are a number of organizations in the Jewish world who are engaging a degree in a degree of participation. The Tzedek Social Justice Fund, which was founded by Amy Mandel. Uh, also in Birmingham, Alabama, the federation there is focused on representation in their allocation committees, as opposed to a minimum gift amount uh, to be able to have that deciding power. Um, SRE, the Safety Respect Equity Coalition and the Jews of Color Initiative have grant-making committees populated by the communities they serve. And you might be familiar with the teen engagement space. For example, BBYO has long empowered teens to decide about their own programs because they believe that the teens are best equipped to assess and act on those needs. At the end of the day, there is fundamentally an opportunity in the Jewish communal world to bring more diversity to the decision-making table. And I'll end with uh, another quote from Rabbi Hillel who taught that we shouldn't separate ourselves from the community. We shouldn't judge our fellow until we arrive at the same situation. And so participatory grant-making invites grant-makers to include more voices from the community in order to make better informed philanthropic decisions that are rooted in the needs of the community. So I'll pass it back to, I'm sorry, I'll pass it on to my colleague Jeray, who's going to introduce our spotlight speaker and, and look forward to your questions and more conversation as we progress. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ariel. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you to JFN and Crown Family Philanthropies for providing a platform for us to discuss PGM. I'm Jeray Akshan, Vice President for Jewish Community Impact at Third Plateau. I also happen to be a former grant-making professional who, prior to joining Third Plateau, was community uh, Jewish Community Program Director for Circle of Service Foundation. It's nice to be back in a granted webinar after several months off. Uh, our conversation today will feature perspectives from Lonnie Santo, CEO of Footsteps, about her experience as a grant recipient through a participatory grant making process. You can read more about Lonnie's background and the incredible work of Footsteps with her bio uh, on their website, which I just shared in the chat with everyone. As Lonnie shares her experience, feel free to post questions in the Q&A. Ariel will be monitoring and will help us select several to spotlight at the end of the conversation. Lonnie, if you would join us, please. Welcome. We're so grateful to have you with us today to share your perspective. I'm going to kick us right off, right off the bat, with a question about your experience. Can you share a bit about what you experienced and what it has been like to receive funds through a PGM process? Sure. First, I want to say thank you to everyone um, for having me here today. Um, I by, by no means, I'm an expert on this. <laughs> I have had um, an experience as a grantee as as um, Jure and Ariel shared and Tamar. Um, so my experience was uh, very early on. I've been CEO of Footsteps for almost 12 years now and uh, probably around year two or three of serving as, as then ED, I uh, was introduced to folks at the New York Women's Foundation um, most of our services are New York. We also provide national services. Um, but, you know, as a New York, uh, as an organization that serves a New York community, um, we were speaking with them and was exposed to a, a new type of uh, grant making process that really warmed my heart. And so I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to share some about it. Um, there was a a grants advisory committee and the New York Women's Foundation for folks who know of it, like like hold up their what they call GAC, grants advisory Co committee members, like very central every year at their breakfast with 2000 people, people applaud their, um, their, their grants advisory committee, they do shout outs to them. It's a big part of the culture of uh, the community foundation that is New York Women's Foundation. And uh, um, I could describe who was around the table if you want, uh, would that be helpful when when we 
So, so it really was introduced at the point of the site visit, right? We had initial conversations with staff and that, you know, that's pretty similar, right? Like with program officers. Um, and then after the point that we were, um, we applied and they decided that we were going to be a finalist of sorts. Um, and I don't believe they really were visiting people who were not strong prospects, I need to say. So like that was a piece of it. Like if you're getting a site visit, it's highly likely that you're going to be selected in this process. Um, in walked, and I, I was a very new, like as an ED, I, I, hadn't, I hadn't done fundraising prior to my job much at Footsteps. I had worked um, in international program development in American Jewish World Service. So I was not coming from the fundraising side, um, you know, as a young, young 30s ED, somewhat intimidated um, by a lot of grant making processes, but this is one that really put me at ease. And um, in walked five people, um, and one of them was the program officer from the foundation, and one was, and, and there were a couple of former EDs and, and recipients of services from other, um, uh, other grant, grant recipients, um, and a board member. So this was, I I'm like, look, I took some notes when Ariel was speaking. I, I believe that this was a combination of a mixed model and rolling applicant because there were former EDs also around the table at least one who I recall who was um, who was uh, there. And I, I specifically remember her questions being really thoughtful, like, oh, you know where you know where I'm sitting. Uh, so I could talk a little bit more about that. But that, you know, and every year that we were grantees, uh, um, there there were there were grant there there were visits. Um, I think the, the first year was really the biggest year that the grants advisory committee came and then maybe a year in between because we were we got a five year um, like renewal grant from them. You mentioned that the process just like made you feel at ease, like that it like you know sometimes you there's we all have ex these experiences of requesting grant money and feeling like what if I answer the question the wrong way it's not going to be heard right and I'm not getting my money and there's anxiety in this process. What about this specifically made it feel made you feel at ease? Um, the questions felt very relevant and coming from a place of informed either professional or lived experience and so um you know when ariel was talking about closing the gap right between um grantors and grantees i think that sometimes that could come from people who are are somewhat removed from in a daily basis from from interacting with community-based organizations and uh, so sometimes questions like will come out of left field and um as a you know as a as someone who is potentially receiving a grant um one might feel like they have to respond in a way that you know i've learned over the years not to be disingenuous but as a young ed i didn't know what to do as a young ed when i was like how what happens if i don't answer this in the way that i think they want me to answer this and so that you know that was that that is and continues to be tricky for for folks especially who are newer to philanthropic spaces i think like once you get your feet wet in in and feel confident in like the work there's a sense of okay, okay like we could engage in this in a different way but especially for folks who are newer grant seekers i think it's a really really important model yeah it's great it allows you to just be really open and honest because they understand exactly what you're going through yeah. as themselves as people who are program providers yeah right that's great. yeah and you speak a little bit about what maybe some of the challenge or limitations of this process might have been you know it's funny i i didn't experience any as a grant seeker right as a grant seeker it was all positive i can't tell you from the foundation side, but I can imagine, right? The more people you involve in a process, the more time consuming it is. And so, you know, when Ariel was speaking to that piece of it, I was like, right, uh, you know, that I couldn't imagine. But again, I wasn't, um, I wasn't on the decision making side, so I can only speak from my experience that it was all positive. So, one of the things that grant makers and great seekers talk about often is that the grant making process can be burdensome. So what I'm hearing from you right now, but I just like to confirm is, did this feel more burdensome to you than other processes? I mean, 
we had, you know, like we had to fit a site visit in and we were given, you know, I think only one option, like you have to make this work. There might have been two, but I don't think that they gave us two options. I think that they gave us enough lead time and said, like, if for some reason you really can't make it, but like they gave us a slot and we made it work and it didn't feel like demanding because they were very transparent about the process from the beginning, right? Like we, ex we knew what to expect. They, they told us that this would be a part of the process from the onset. And once I was there, I, I just, I felt so much, it, it made me want to support. I, I am a supporter of New York Women's Foundation partially because I've had such positive experiences as a grantee. I'll say that. Like, what a lovely side benefit, <laughs> an unintended outcome for them. That's right. Great. I mean, I was just like, this is an organization that I want to get behind because I, I really appreciate their philosophy and what they're doing in the world. So um, it did not feel burdensome and it felt like we were closer. We became part of a broader community, right? Like that mm -hmm. the ecosystem piece, I met people I wanted to follow up with afterwards to ask them questions about how the, they deliver services, for instance. Great. That's great. Yeah. So Ariel shared, this is still an emerging practice. We're still learning, but there are more and more funders exploring PGM as a model for their own grant making. At this stage and with your experience, what seems clear to you about PGM and what do you think we need to continue to research and understand and clarify about the process? Yeah. You know, as Ariel was speaking and as Tamar was introducing me, I like had a flashback to I think it was last February and that uh, I was on a webinar, a JFN webinar as part of the poverty affinity group, the National Poverty Affinity Group. And the topic was about lived experience. And I'm getting I'm getting to your question. Um, but it was the topic was about engaging um, those of lived experience and decision making more. And, you know, I would just say, and I was, you know, I was in conversation with E.D. Klein and Yavila McCoy, and at the end, we were trying to get to concrete examples of how this could happen more. And this is a really concrete example. And like Ariel said, like, I, I don't believe that the, the GAC, as they called it, they didn't have final decision making. It was not... It was the GAC gave their recommendation to the program officers and the board and and the board and the okay. board voted on it, right? So the board was still voting on it. There was a member of the board who was on the site visit as well. Um, and so, you know, I think that from the space of how do we include those of lived experience more and those in decision making, this is this it, it is low hanging fruit, right? You don't have to wholly change your strategy. You don't have to give over decision making. It helps to build trust and relationships between grant makers and grant seekers in a really beautiful way. And I do think that you know there. I can anticipate timing wise, people would have to adjust their timeline. And like I said, I don't think we had it every year. It was really only our first year as a grantee that we had this big process. Um, and then it was it was site visits from the program officer um, after that. Um, I think that I can imagine maybe conflict of interest, but that's, you know, you just you just don't go to that grantee. That piece I, I think could be resolved a little bit more um, and selecting people that could really Right, like we think about this a lot at Footsteps. We have member advisory council. We have members on our board. We have members on staff. Yeah, right, for 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 those of lived experience to to be in leadership, they have to be able to come out of their own personal experience and see, right, see the in this case the grant seekers, the grant makers' priorities, understand them, and be able to represent them separate from their personal feelings and that's that i could see you know like so that's a selection point piece mm -hmm. and then in terms of decision making i think just being really clear that this is you know whatever folks decide they should be clear about the 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 you know this group's role in decision making are they the final decision makers or not are they providing input right what where is that and just i think setting expectations from the beginning is helpful and then and then really listening 
to those with the with the lived and professional experience um is hard is maybe sometimes hard when when professionals and i can say this for myself like have a pre-imagined vision of what maybe an outcome should be or where something should land and it's different it's it's hard and like you have to train yourself to say okay if i am actually saying that those with lived experience are the experts here and those with professional experience are, are more expert than i am or have some level of more expertise right they're not more of an expert but they have a different lens then you really need to to be prepared to listen to that and it's tricky when folks aren't ready to do that because then you know that's that's where that's where um friction could come yeah, it's a really important point i'm really glad you named it that this piece of we all come with ideas of how we might fix a challenge, how, what grant would make the most impact, what program intervention we might provide that would provide the most impact, the most meaning in someone's lives. And then we have lived experience and those things do not always mesh. And it's a really hard thing sometimes for folks to hear and address. I'm curious, given your experience of, I know we're I'm switching a little bit from grant making, but I think it applies to the PGM model. If you could speak about how you've um, manage that tension within footsteps that might be a tool for how grant makers might manage that tension between lived experience of, of potential grantees and their own practices. Yeah, I mean, I could think of a, I think I could think of an example that's happening right now, right? We're in the middle of a strategic planning process. Uh, we're trying to decide what growth means to us again, right? And we are pretty, we are, we are pretty clear that we want to hear from community members and we you know we've done focus groups and community surveys and we have like i said you know, alumni if you will on our board and our staff um and it's tricky um in in i think the impact question is tricky and and the question of scaling is often really tricky because if you talk to people who are receiving services often they want like you to focus on the quality of those services. And, uh, um, and that's really important, right? Like, what is what does growth mean? Does it always mean scaling and going to new places? And what is it? What happens when you um, spread yourself too thin as an organization? And what's the impact on the folks receiving services? And I think that if you, you know, if we if we all can prioritize listening as we're making strategic decisions, are our folks will tell us what the impact is for them and they will share concerns right about like if i'm worried that if you go into this area it will spread you too thin we've heard that in focus groups right we have we're not in a place where we've made any decisions yet but sitting with that you know makes me as a leader who wants to do you know who wants to deepen the quality of our services and strengthen them and then also wants to do all these new things that have been on the back burner for 10 years, right? Like wants to get some forward. It, it, it gives me more pause to say, okay, like let's really make sure that we could bite off what we could chew here. I don't know if that exactly answers your question or provides an example of it, but you know, certainly that's, that's one thing that comes to mind just in the work right now. Yeah, that's great. It's, it's, um, it's another data point and the many data points that you're collecting to make decisions and to have that lived experience, how you elevate that data point might depend on the organization, its priorities, but it provides a really interesting data point for sure. Right. We're, we're also talking to funders, right? Like, so oh, it's, exactly. That's another data point. Exactly. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, so just to turn back to, to PGM specifically for a moment, I'm curious if you have thoughts about, you, you already mentioned the National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty. I'm curious as one potential area, but I'm curious whether parts of Jewish philanthropy you might think feels ripest to explore PGM. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, giving circles often are doing it already, right? Like there are people of a community thinking about it and we've certainly had folks reach out to us. Um, it's hard to speak. I, I, it's hard to speak. I don't, I, like I'm not sitting in other places, right? So I can't say, oh, you should consider this. I will say that uh, where the gap sometimes feels the widest and we have so, so much gratitude to, to the federation system is in, is in the federation spaces. Mm -hmm. um, 
where the model is really based on engaging lay leaders as much as possible in decision making and that and the question of who knows like who knows best and around like i have often found um you know sometimes program officers having to say to me you know i i do see this as a priority but i'm not sure our lay leaders would and i've i have rarely encountered that in other um, Jewish philanthropic spaces and community-based foundations that we work with that are, you know, not Jewish. And so I think really sitting with that and thinking about uh, who the experts are, whether it's your staff, right? Like right there, right at, at a given foundation or federation. Um, and then and then relying on the staff because they're closest to the, the folks in the field and then thinking about how to bring the folks in the field back into it. and importantly how to engage lay leaders in decision making right like and and in meaningful con contributions to the work certainly um but i really wonder what would it look like i can even think of of a federation committee that i was on that had like that we were grant uh, that we received grants for when we received um the grant uh around moisha house from new york federation we had a partnership with moisha house like there were there were um more community members who were on that particular grants committee, um, uh, former leaders or people who happen to have roles in, in colleague organizations, and that it felt different, and and um, it leveled the questions out in a way that felt a, a little bit more relevant when we were being interviewed. Yeah, that's that makes sense, and I think uh, not surprisingly, another really interesting point for you of like bringing all of those viewpoints together that we want to engage lay leaders, it's important, we want to engage funders, it's important, we want to engage community members, it's important, and, and how do you build a container that can hold that and allow for decision making? And, and I say, it? yeah, and I say that with deep, deep gratitude to, to Federation New York, Federa New York, um, UGA Federation of New York is, is you know, of our um, large supporters. And so it's, it's, and, you know, and there are other types of spaces that have built out or, um, around this lay leadership model, I think that it's, it's, then it's also a question of who are the lay leaders. So maybe bringing more community members into lay leadership is another way of doing that. Yeah, that's great. Any other um, examples of PGM or examples of collaborative um, grant making or decision making that you'd like to share with the group um, that could be useful as they think about this work? Yeah, I would just say in terms of capacity building for grantees to, to think about um, as we've, um, emerged in, in there's there's a field now of organizations that are thinking about how to serve and advocate on behalf of those who choose to leave Haredi communities. And so we are one of a number of organizations now. And so in that role as convener, we've really started to think about our multiplier effect. And, and pre-COVID, we had uh, a program that we're soon to bring back that is a micro-grant program to put um, you know, to put power like the the power of programming into our members' hands because they can do the best, uh, right? Like they know best how to run programs for their peers. We don't have to do that all, and they know best the community changes that need to happen. So it's a social impact and community impact micro grant program. It's called Ignite, and we um, over the years have been thinking about and haven't just like haven't per se had enough capacity, right? This is a capacity question to. Um, ask ourselves, how do we bring maybe me member leaders into helping to make the decision making around this? And so I really do get that tension of like, you know, we're 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 just we're just trying to like have the the budget to do this, let alone uh, right to the for the pass through funds, let alone the staff time that's that's needed to lead a participatory process. It's much more time intensive, and so. You know, I just want to acknowledge that even as a, um, you know an organization that does some micro grant work, it's tricky for us to to bring this into reality because of capacity um, and resource issues. So, yeah, it's a great point, and I really, um, Lonnie, really appreciate everything that you've shared with us. And I think there's some great tidbits to take away. Everything from the use of PGM as a truly transparent process that could put you at ease that made you feel seen by those in the community. Um, and your notes about the importance of um, bringing people with lived experience to the table, whether it's through program decision-making or grant-making decision-making um, and acknowledging that this probably does take, as you just noted, a lot of capacity and that we have to think about 
um, the both the benefits and the challenges of the process as we consider how we motivate our work. Yeah, I have yeah. one more thought, if I if I may. Um, I it it doesn't come without trickiness to have, um, especially folks who've been marginalized brought into the like more center of decision making. Um, you know, for communities that have been marginalized, there's a lot of uh, under like deeply understandable mistrust of authority and systems. And so these are folks that will question at every corner and that's important. It's part of their nature, right? I mean, for footsteps, it's like core to someone's nature. If you're questioning, leaving the entire world you were born into, um, then part of your natural inclination is to be a questioner and a seeker and, a, and, um, and, and an individuator. And also this is true for other marginalized communities um, and not to let that scare folks away from, right? Like people will have strong opinions and that's okay. And uh, like, don't not do it because it's, it's, um, it's tricky or it takes, you know, relationship, you know, smoothing, but like work to build those, that trust in the beginning with the people who you're involving in the process. To, so. Yeah, thank you. Excellent point to end us out. Um, thank you so much for your time. I'm going to invite everyone um, in the audience to please submit questions if you um, have them. And Arielle, if you want to come back to join us, we can do a Q&A um, from here. Thank you, Lonnie. Thanks, Jure. So we do have one question from... Uh, thank you for submitting that. Uh, I'll just read it out loud. And then uh, Lonnie, maybe you can respond and I might have some thoughts to share as well. So Lonnie mentioned that, you mentioned Lonnie in your experience that the board of the foundation still ultimately was the final decision maker, right? That the GAC, I believe, uh, made their decisions and then it went up the chain to the board. And so I was asking about policies like this that might actually serve to further marginalize those who are part of the PGM process. What are the impacts of giving power that in the end might be overruled by those with more privilege? So thanks for that question. Lonnie, happy to hear your thoughts on it, and I can share from some of our research as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I mentioned I, I used to work for American Jewish World Service, so I think I'll share this as a staff member of a for, of a grant maker. Um, I wasn't on the grant making side. I was had close colleagues there, and the board always like approved the final docket. I'll say I, I never heard of a time that the board overruled it. Um, they they like relied on the expertise of the staff, and so it was. Uh, um, I wouldn't say it was a formality, and I don't know how HAWS, like, you know, I, I know that they have committees with board members who are really involved in it. And I believe that, you know, even on those committees, they really look to the expertise of the staff who have heard from community members and, and rarely, I, I don't, I, I think only in very controversial cases, uh, I never heard of it. I worked for AJWS for seven years and I never heard of a docket like not being approved. <laughs> so I don't, I, and I would leave this to like maybe DeRay from right in your experience. I don't know how a circle of uh, the, yeah, your, for, your former <laughs> funder worked, but um, you know, I. Yeah, I, I think you actually spoke to it that. beautifully earlier, Alani, when you talked about transparency and understanding the process. And so I think Meredith, it's a really valid and really important to point to bring up that to bring in outside voices who then might not feel validated um, if a decision doesn't go the right way can be hard. And I also think if you um, are really open and honest about what your process looks like from everything from the timeline to the realistic expectation of grant money um, to who's engaged in the process, you provide a space to say your voice is important here. We really wanna hear it it will go into what we present to the board. And while we cannot guarantee that things will move forward, please know that it's, it's heard, it's important, and we will continue to hear it. I think that level of transparency, if that's um, how your organization works, is really important to, um, what did you call it earlier, Lonnie? Um, relationship smoothing, right? Of like keeping those relationships strong and honest and forthcoming while also being realistic about what it means to be a part of a process. Yeah, and then there's also, training for board members and making sure they understand, right? Like how any given organization sees their, like sees a role in, in decision-making and right. Like yeah, different organizations give, you know, have different perspectives on that. And, and I imagine different foundations do. And so like 
making sure that when board members are onboarded, they get that they have that understanding as well, right? So it goes in both ways, the, the expectation setting. Absolutely. Well, I can I can chime in here also to say, of course, you're right that if there's a process laid out that is um, that purports to give some sort of decision making influence to a group, especially a marginalized group, and that's then overridden by those who actually hold all the power, that can be extremely damaging, right? And so at the end of the day, it comes down to what the grant makers actual goals are, right, in involving more participation, and what they can do in furtherance of those goals. It's, it's obvious that um, listening to people, but then ignoring their recommendations is not going to further your relationships, it's not going to bring about more equitable funding, right? It's, it's tokenizing and, and um, counterproductive. So in the research, there was a lot that came up about the difference between, or really the spectrum um, between listening and empowering. And everyone will fall at a different place on that spectrum or in, um, informed by their goals and what they're trying to achieve by involving more participation. And so if funders have that in mind and are transparent with themselves and their aims, then presumably there wouldn't be um, that sort of overriding. We have a question here um, from, is there any expectation that those invited into the process are also bringing in voices of others who are not in the room. There is a selectivity to who gets in the room in the first place that they that may not be representative of the field or the issue. That's a fantastic question. Um, Lanyat, I don't know if you feel comfortable addressing that or if you'd like me to go first. Why don't you go first and I'll give my perspective after. So this gets at a very sensitive and important idea and it's something I touched on before about um, tokenizing. There is an expectation that the people in the room are representing the community that they are a part of. This goes back to the question of who actually are the participants. It's not necessarily um, some any uh, random individual who happens to have a certain identity. It's people with um, with experience, uh, whether they're leaders of organizations or really deeply connected with a specific network or community. Again, researchers, activists, and so on. And so, with that in mind there's less risk of tokenizing, I think, if they have that breadth of knowledge and experience and relationship. Uh, and you're absolutely right that there is a selectivity to who gets in the room. And so the question about how a grant maker um, extends invitations that to people who are different from them or to people who are not immediately in their network is very challenging. Um, and again, I think it goes back to the need for relationship building for trust and honesty, right? When there's trust with different communal partners, trust across organizations, those invites become easier to make. And um, I'll, I'll pause there. Yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm reminded of moments when I've been asked to be a reader on applications, um, whether it was at Bikurim with you, Aliza, right, as an alum, uh, or, uh, or, uh, the Covenant Foundation, which doesn't fund us, but like, you know, we've been in conversation with over the years and I collectively decided like, oh, good, let's not try to fit around uh, a, 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 like a, a square into a round hole, right? So like, but also collegial. And so like they invited me to be a reader one year. And so I think that, um, you know, thinking of people both inside of your networks, and I guess the reason I'm bringing up Covenant is like, we're not a grantee, but you know, they thought, okay, maybe Lonnie has a perspective on this that she could offer um, that that is a way of thinking about expanding who's like who's in the room and in, in giving input into decisions. Um, I will say I can only answer this question, Aliza, that you raise um, from my experience in terms of bringing people onto member advisory councils or boards. And I would, you know, I would say that what I said to Jare earlier, we don't, um, we are we are careful when we ask people to step into leadership positions that they could step out of their own perspective like ariel said like and you know see the broader perspective of the organization and their priorities so in this case the foundation and its priorities um i would also say that we specifically say to board members you are not representatives of the community you are standing there as your own person because it puts a lot of pressure a lot of pressure and I say this as a like alum of the Abu Dhabi board that, you know, like 
if I was meant to, to be a representative of all Avoda alumni on the board, I couldn't do that because I don't know what they were thinking, right? I could only speak to my experience. Uh, and so saying that to someone who's on uh, like on a committee, we don't expect you to, to be representing the entire com community. We, we hope that you will think about people beyond yourself. And we know that we can't expect you to, to be in their heads. Um, when you're, you know, making your recommendations or, or making the decisions. I'll just add also that a key part of participatory grant making is the nothing about us without us ethos, which um, a number of groups and organizations, uh, excuse the flies in my apartment, claim. Um, also, the, the disability rights movement uses this claim. And it's important to not be afraid to make mistakes, right? And to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, meaning for an organization to, it's very challenging to have completely accurate, complete representation, but there's somewhere to start. And hopefully by building trust and those relationships, grant makers can expand the reach of those networks. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add one other note. If anyone has an additional question, we're happy to field it. Um, I wanted to note that certainly many grant makers think about the actual mechanics, and we didn't touch on that too much today. How do we actually go about doing participatory grant making? Where do we start? Who do we speak with? And so when the guidebook is released, it includes a number of uh, practical steps actually to take, questions to ask oneself, um, relationships to build. There's also a, an active and growing community of practice yeah, you can find it online very easily. It's called the Participatory Grant Making Community of Practice. Uh, and there, there are a number of funders internationally, researchers, and people really um, dedicated to discussing, exploring, testing, sharing feedback about participation. They are a really wonderful and lively group who immediately and generously give feedback and reflection. So anyone uh, before the guidebook is published interested in learning more, can certainly look at the participatory grant making community of practice. I saw a question in the chat about the book I mentioned before. It's called Letting Go. I'll hold it up here just for a minute. This is one of a number of um, really comprehensive explorations of participation. They give a really valuable history and overview. This is by Ben Robel and Meg Macy. Anyone interested in further reading can also look at Dr. Cynthia Gibson's work. She has published a number of pieces that we cite heavily in the guidebook. Okay, Tamar, I think we'll pass back to you to close us out. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lonnie and Rachel and Jare and Ariel for this informative and interesting and engaging webinar and for all the work that, that you do. Um, this is just really the beginning of a larger communal conversation, or at least what we hope will be the beginning of a larger communal conversation. And please be in touch with us. Um, we set up a, if you have questions or want more information, we set up an email address, pgm at jfunders.org. So you can reach out to us there and we will get you that information. The guidebook that we've been talking about that we're really excited about um, publishing is going to be out later this month. I will send it to all of you that signed up. I have your email addresses and we'll send that to you um, when it's right off the presses and I'm excited for you to get to read that, learn more. And like Ariel just said, there's more um, there's more step-by-step -step instructions and more things to dig into. If you have any other questions, Dore and Ariel also are open to, to speaking to you. You can reach out to them. I will put that in the chat. Hold on just one moment. Um, those are their, their email addresses. And I also wanted to remind everybody that our next um, granted webinar will be on April 26, Tuesday, April 26, from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. And it's going to be about improving organizational health, health for greater impact. And I will put the link for that also in the chat. Sorry for all the different links, um, but we have always have so much going on. So I want to thank you all again for participating today and starting this conversation about participatory grant making. Like we said before, there's so much to learn and ways to to think about how you can how you can use this in your own philanthropy and in your own grant making and grant seeking. And we hope to be able to continue this conversation in the coming months. 
And thank you. Thank you for being here and looking forward to learning with all of you again soon. Have a great day.